Wonderful. So welcome to the money issue of Thriving Through Me's Life. The research has found that our confidence in our own financial situation is linked directly to the number of obligations we have at certain points in our life. The maximum number of obligations typically occur in midlife. This is the period when things like home loans, mortgages, weddings, children, education, aging parents, healthcare, all compete for our time and money. Taking the, those expenses into consideration, it's no wonder that women in midlife and above feel stretched and are among the most, the least confident about their finances. Divorce and separations can add to the stress of women who may have um, delegated finances to their partners. There is ample evidence that financial stress contributes in a large part to midlife crisis. So our speakers are beautiful Jane Monica Jones, Amanda Thompson, and Tanga Yose. I hope I got that right, Tanga. So we're going to share our speaker's bio in the chat. Okay, and I will go, I'm going to just jump straight in. We're going to start with Jane, and then we're going to go to um, Tanga and then Amanda. Okay, so can you share your journey into working with money with us as an intro? Sure, thanks. Thanks for having me, uh, Faith, and thank you and welcome everybody this morning. Look, the truth is my journey into money was being really terrible with money originally. Um, when I used to work in corporate, used to make lots of uh, money and then lose a lot of money. And then I moved into, you know, I, I retrained as a therapist and I thought, you know, there's something around this thing called money that um, is, a, is very particular. And I think, you know, often we have this feeling that we're very competent in many areas, areas of our life, yet when it comes to money, we, we might freeze or we might get a little bit sort of or lack of that confidence that you're talking about. Um, so, yeah, I really focused my practice of working with people around that issues of money. And it just takes us to that place of vulnerability, of fear, of lack of empowerment. And I think it, it's, it needs a lot more nourishment in a way than, than the narrative that we often see, which is, you know, you just need a lot of more, uh, more money, you know. So that's often a very kind of psychologically unsafe uh, expression, I think. And there's certainly lots of um, not much psychological safety around money. Um, so that's, yeah, part of my passion is to just bring it as, as a safe conversation and a bit more empowered conversation around money. Yeah. Thank you. And what I loved what you said, reminding us that, you know, the solution is not just about getting more money. And that's one thing. That's a hard thing to learn. But that's something that I've learned. Because if you don't know how to manage it, it actually doesn't matter how much you have. So, yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah. So, Tanya, yeah. we'll go to you. Thank you so much. Uh, the themes are very similar here, Jane. Um, so my uh, journey started actually in the banking industry. And so I was one of the top lenders. And in those dark days, I put a lot of people into debt and sold a lot of products on the side and uh, moved into mortgage brokering because I was performing really well in, in that area. Um, but what I hadn't learned was what I was to learn for the next 20 years of my life after I was diagnosed with breast cancer, which was quite aggressive. I was 39. That was back in 2005. And shortly after the breast cancer, um, going through the chemo and the radiation therapy, um, we pretty much lost everything. We went straight into financial hardship, lost everything. And really the last 20 years have been about rebuilding and learning this thing about money that is not taught in much of our financial literacy education, which we know is very patriarchal. Um, and so when we learn to get this balance, I found uh, we get to make sustainable choices around our, the way that we spend. But education is a big piece of that. And so a lot of the work that I'm doing is focusing on bringing that balance back in. I work in, my background is financial counselling since then. Um, I work with financial coaches at the moment who help people or women that are rebuilding after domestic violence. And we know that money control is one of the key indicators or the earlier indicators of um, 
control. And so there is a lot of talk that we do in discussions around that space as well. So that's a little bit about me. Um, thank you again for this space, Faith. I suspect that it is going to go a little while, but this is what we need. We need spaces like this so that we can have these robust conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for your contribution. So let's go to you, Amanda. Morning. Um, my story is a little bit uh, interesting. And so I'm going to go straight to why I started my business in money, because we could be here forever of how I ended up in money. Um, and the reason I started my own business was similar to the stories we've heard. I grew up, grew up in financial planning for our major banks. And basically, from the moment I started there, it ate away at my soul. And I decided that I was going to rebel against a male orientated and directed system and hence endurance financial and a different way of educating women in particular um, arose. So, and here I am today. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. And I, and I love the emphasis on women. I know that most of us will work with other people, you know, we're meant to, but I think that we, there is something unique about the way women navigate money. So I appreciate that emphasis. So we'll go to the question two. So, so what are the common money mistakes made by women in general and women in particular? Sorry, and women in midlife in particular. Okay, let's start with you, Jane. Um, uh, there's something that you said right before we started the call, which is around um, the way that women are with money is, is we could say generally that, you know, we may not have as much agency. And I think that's the thing that I think that we're kind of socialized or certain generations are that, that women weren't the, the money maker, the, the had the agency inside of the family structure. Now, because of that, what gets lacking for a lot of women is confidence. And, and what I like to call, or my training sort of talks about, is that sort of healthy level of aggression, yeah? I'm going to take this by the short and curlies in a way. When we don't have that confidence and empowerment, that kind of, yep, I'm, I'm ready to take it on, it makes it very difficult to, to kind of have deep agency in that. So the fact that we have not been conditioned or socialized in having great financial authority or great uh, yeah, confidence really makes us wobble when it comes to those decisions. So for me, money is not money. Money is all the soft skills. It is the empowerment, the, the confidence, the capacity to manage risk, the capacity to manage stress. When we work on, and, and I, I think you said too, you know, so much growth can happen around it, is, is that when we work on all those qualities, it impinges so much of our life. And so the being confident, having money sorted is having all those things that usually for men, or boys is very much taught and socialized, which we don't get as women, unfortunately. It's probably getting a whole lot better in different generations. But certainly in the generation I was brought up in was just that, yeah, you'll be at home, you'll just do the smaller pieces and let the men do the real work. Now that has a lot to do with, it just impacts our self-esteem. It impacts our self-confidence. And so that unfortunately we are of a generation, particularly at the moment, where that we're lacking those core socialized experiences so building everything doing the work around confidence and empowerment really liberates our capacity to meet our financial challenges and our financial growth in that way thank you and I loved what you said about it really look what it looks like is confidence but that healthy level of aggression and I inserted assertiveness you know which gives us that authority so I love that thank you Okay, Tanga. My head is going to fall off. The, the, the nodding that I'm doing is like, oh, my goodness, drop the mic. This is powerful, and I'm, I'm feeling so aligned in this space. Thank you so much, Jane, for that wisdom, because the, the focus um, really is around understanding that we actually have a lot of resilience when we think about it, because the study around trauma, and, and I think someone mentioned before, having been to trauma things during the week, uh, it's also traumas and the 
the um, the layers that they have brought, and I I call it intersectionality um, in our relationship with money. We've got the generational, we've got relational, um, and and we can go into this in a little bit deeper. But when we think about the the, the systemic traumas that we have lived through. Um, it turns up in the decisions that we have around spending. Uh, it turns up in the soothing mechanisms that we use. Um, and we're not even aware of it. So it could be that I'm out in the middle of the shopping centre because I've just had an argument with someone or there's been something happened on the roads and I might turn to soothing that looks like going out and doing a little bit of shopping. You know? And so when we start to really delve into those layers and understand where these behaviours are coming from, it really allows us to build, Jane, agency and confidence and also to reduce shame. So for me, it's um, working with reducing shame that leads into us not talking to each other, right, to um, increasing discernment, our ability to recognise what's happening in our system. And we mentioned it before, trauma is held in your body. And so when we understand that our decisions around how we use our money is often causing a lot of money leaks through our spending, we get to plug a lot of those holes as well. Yeah, really powerful. Thank you so much. I really love what jumped out for me was that link between systemic trauma mm -hmm. and the self-soothing choices that we make. Because I see it in my practice, a lot of women will go and shop and they'll blow all their money because they're in pain, you know. So I love that link. So thank you. Over to you, Amanda. I think I'm going to play bad cop here a little bit. <laughs> um, while I completely agree that confidence is the major issue surrounding women and money, first of all, I dislike the word mistakes because who's to say that we make mistakes with money? Um, it all comes down to education and the courage to get education. And everyone's talked about, um, yeah, as I said, confidence is huge. Self-empowerment is huge. But as women, as women, we don't put ourselves first. Generally speaking, we're mothers, we're wives, we're um, employees, we run businesses, we have employees. And so what I think the issue comes down to is having the courage to go and get the education that we require to be in charge of our own finances. So there's a very fine line between being kind to ourselves and putting money in the too hard basket or the trauma basket um, and the going and standing up and being encouraged and saying, yes, I am going to go and seek the services of a Jane to, to talk through tra trauma or to go and look after my superannuation. Because at the end of the day, that is our money, regardless of whether we've got no money or not, superannuation is our money. And we should be teaching the generations after us how important it is. So I think that, yes, while confidence is a huge issue and there's people like us here today that are joining as a community to build each other's confidence up, we still have to take a deep breath, jump off that bridge um, and go and learn about money and what we can do because they're not mistakes. We're not making mistakes because we're actually not doing anything about it to make mistakes in the first place. Beautiful, thank you. And I love that, you know, reiterating that this is this space is not an echo chamber and I love that we've got um, different views and I don't think the views are that different, but I think they're coming from different places. And, and I love the emphasis on, on courage because we do need to do, we do need to acknowledge the reasons why, you know, we are the way we are, but then we need to take the action. And what I hear is your emphasis, Amanda, is around taking that action and we need courage for that piece. So I love that. Thank you very much for that. So let's go to question three. So what was your um, most painful money experience? Am I the first one to have off the rank? That's painful. <laughs> okay. Oh, gosh. All of it. <laughs> you know, I, I was brought up in a middle-class family and um, 
and I was the youngest of five girls or everybody went to university and then I was the black sheep in retrospect you know I did I had undiagnosed ADD I had lots of you know early birth trauma which um, really affected my sense of safety and and capacity um and and then it built my you know it really affected my self-esteem so that somewhere in there, I thought, you know, I am intelligent, yet somehow I did a lot of self-soothing through by, you know, making lots of money and losing it, spending it. I mean, like, you know, whole generation of, of spending it on shoes, you know, or clothes and things like that and realizing that that was how I was trying to build my self-esteem. Um, so, yeah, just that for me, it was very overcoupled in a sense of self-value and self-esteem or lack thereof. Um, and then that made it mean that, yeah, I was just, you know, frittering away that money that I, that I, that I had also to, you know, what I see often working with people, um, is, is that when we aren't down regulated and I talk for, you know, I'm a somatic experiencing practitioner and so, somatic means body. So when we're not regulated, it's very difficult for us to, to settle into long-term, into clarity, into, you know, progress and focus. And so, yeah, that was most of my life was just not being able to be really settled so that I could stay on a goal in a way. And so when that I started to really work on being able to regulate myself and not do it through outer purchasing or outer experiences, then I was better able to stick to a goal. So that's kind of had been my journey of, of really doing deep self work uh, as a way to 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 kind of uh, settle myself that I could then, you know, stick at a goal, stick at a job, stick at a, a stick at a plan in a way that I had never done before. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to jump straight over to Tanya. Yeah, look, um, and I guess my biggest shame was the breast cancer happened. I had all this theory in this front of my brain from the banking that this is how you do things but I was never able to stick to it. And there was a lot of shame around that. How could I have gotten to a point where we lost everything despite knowing the theory? And I would also then extend that to how come I can't stick to a diet, even though I know that that chocolate and the bar of chocolate is not good for me? How come I won't stick to that? And a lot of it comes down to my dysregulated system. So when I learned that actually I was in a trauma response, why? Because I was constantly trying to fix things and run and I was scared that things were going to happen. Um, I was scared about security. I was scared about judgment. There was fear. Even fear of public speaking throws me out of whack. So when I learned that there is actually a part of our brain that flips out when we're in a trauma response, it doesn't matter what you're going to teach me because I'm going to go into this fear, freeze, I'm going to stop, I'm going to either fight it, I'm either going to try and please people. Those are all parts of trauma triggers that happen. And so when we learn, as Jane, I agree with Jane, that's the work that I've been doing is to really focus on where is that trauma sitting? What's actually happening? Because my body doesn't know that that actually was in the past. I'm still triggered. So I'm still only thinking short term. That's what human beings do. When we're trauma, we go into this fight, flight or freeze. And so when we don't know how to plan beyond the now, we it, it's important to resettle our system so that our thinking brain does come back and get engaged so that we can make these critical decisions that are long lasting. Beautiful. Thank you. We'll go straight to Amanda. Um, other than the STD that I got being sexually transmitted debt, um, and when I left my husband, um, I am going to go on from my previous answer to question. My biggest um, money trauma is be, being an empath. And what I do is, is really feeling what my clients come to me with and all the experiences I've had as a financial planner and the pain and emotion that I see so many women go through in so many different experiences, whether it's the loss of a husband, um, illness, like both Jaina and Taga have um, mentioned. It, it, again, it's just 
I, I can't let go. I go to bed thinking of my clients and I want to not keep doing that. I want to be kind to myself. And the only way for me to do that is educate through this. So my biggest money um, trauma is generally seeing people have such sadness attached to money choices. Mm, thank you. And we all love in the chat too, I love that sexually transmitted debt. A friend of mine uses that term and it always makes me laugh. It's so excellent. Thank you. And many of you know in the community, the mind was around my business. You know, that what triggered my midlife crisis was I had to close the business that I had for 14 years. And I made lots of bad choices in that business. You know, I should have walked away a long time ago, but I stayed for 14 years and I nearly became bankrupt as a process. I was advised to go bankrupt and I'm so glad I didn't, I refused and I did pay all my debts back and, you know, rebuild, but it was a really, really painful time. And that time, you know, stays with me. And I do see that time as a trauma because it was a very painful time, but you know, like we're learning with some education, we can change that. So. Faith, and, and, and I think, I don't know who mentioned it, but we are as women resilient and sometimes. Amazing. Even most, yeah. Even the mm. most traumatic experiences grow us, grow, grow us, grow our businesses yeah. to be the people we are today. So again, I have this issue with trauma, you know, trauma or mistakes, those words. You're getting a theme from me is yeah. what but we can only get stronger. And yeah. you know what? They're thrown at women because we are the stronger. Yeah, gender, the strong, stronger gender. And we yeah, can yeah. handle it with a group of women like we have here today yeah. and being in a safe, confident space. We, we can overcome anything together. Yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so that leads us to our question four, which is how can we as women in midlife prepare for an abundant third chapter? Over to you, Jane. Yeah, um, and I agree totally with Amanda. You know, the thing is, is that my definition of financial well-being is financial financial literacy, which is what Amanda's talking about, which is the knowledge and education that we need to understand financial products and financial instruments. Then we need to have what I was starting and, and Tang is talking about as well, is that financial capability. I feel capable to implement the knowledge yeah that is financial well-being so you've got to have the knowledge you've got to feel capable and empowered and then that means that you're going to achieve it so what you know we're, what we're speaking today is 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 the components of that mm -hmm. so we need to get the knowledge I'm at the end we'll talk about a beautiful offering that I've got with the financial well-being company which is a lot 100 and 100 plus hours of education that we run uh, through my organization that people are going to get a giveaway to. Um, but it is, it's about getting that knowledge to, to really understand what you may not have experienced earlier. If that say if in a partnership that that was the, the realm of your partner that was taking on that. Yeah. You need to have a level of agency around taking hold of the financial knowledge that you don't have as well as what's the barriers that stop you from that? Is that your trauma? Is that your lack of confidence? It, it, you know, if we look at that formula of financial literacy plus financial capability that equals financial well-being, then you can look at yourself, well, where am I on that scale? Where, what's missing in those? So yes, it needs both. It absolutely needs the education, but it also needs that, that self-agency as well. So I think that's, you know, a good formula for us to, to really uh, prop ourselves up and support ourselves. Yeah, beautiful. So that a recipe for financial well-being, and I hear is that financial literacy, which is the education component, and then the financial capacity, which I is an action component, which is what I hear Amanda's talking about a lot. So thank you, brilliant. Okay, over to you, Tanga. Love it. Um, so yes, and like building off that. Um, in terms of, because for many of us, we've gone through, we're part of these statistics, right? We, we made these statistics that we see now that are a little bit troublesome. So where do you start though? Where, where do, where, what's the line in the sand moment? Where do you start? And, and that's why I love this question. And when we start to re, re imagine what our life would be if I was totally aligned with all of my values, 
um, I call it your North Star. If we reimagine and remember what we're wanting to achieve, Stephen Covey calls it in his book, um, you know, starting with the end in mind, then we get to do with this little phase called an inventory. And we get to do that with less shame. We get to understand, oh, okay, well, maybe I'm not actually where I actually think I should be or want to be. And to take that harmonizing approach where we get to make different decisions, that is all going to be in alignment with that North Star. And all of us have it differently. But what we get to do is say, hold on, whose shame am I coming to this with? Is it my parents? Is it my teachers? Is it the banks? Is it societies? What am I actually really doing? And when we start to touch base with what our true agency is, we get to make those decisions to realign with it as well. And there's an amazing term called PTSG, post-traumatic stress, stress growth, yeah. where we get to, there's a really good book uh, that the CFO of uh, Facebook wrote, uh, Option B, that I would recommend anyone read. So it's not denying that these hardships have occurred, is recognising the resilience that we've built off the back of that. So I get to, Steve Jobs calls it joining the dots looking back. We get to look back and go, actually, that was pivotal for me to learn something about myself that I didn't already know. Yeah, beautiful. So acknowledge the, the blocks and the, the garbage that stops us from being um, financially confident. And I love the, the PTSG, post-massive growth syndrome. That's beautiful. Stress growth, yep. Stress growth, fantastic. Okay, over to you, Amanda. We really are a powerhouse of three financials, <laughs> aren't we? Yeah. It's just feeding off each other. It's amazing. It's so enjoyable. Um, I come from it with the lens of that women's intuition is a well-known concept and we are fantastic at it except when it comes to ourselves. So again, I'm all about looking in and figuring ourselves out. And I say to uh, my clients, if you feel something's wrong, chances are it is. And again, it comes down to having the courage. So as, as women midlife getting ready to be abundant and, and manifest it, first of all, we've got to believe it to achieve it, um, is setting your own goals. And those are not the goals that you hear any of us say today or that you read anywhere. They're your own personal goals and they do align to the values that we've spoken about. So you've got to stop, first of all, just stop in a moment and figure out who you are and who, who you want to be and where you want to go. Most of our personal goals, no matter what they are, will have some type of um, money attached to it. You know, for me, I use the example, for me, I do triathlons and I want to um, get on the world stage of triathlon. That doesn't come for free. It, and, you know, as much as it's a personal goal and you can attribute it to being fit or healthy, unfortunately, to travel anywhere in Sandy, you know, this travel to Hawaii costs a lot of money. So I need to attach that financial need to that personal goal. That's just an example. Other people I hear go, I just want to go on date night with my husband once a fortnight. But, you know, it's still going to cost to go on that date night or to get a babysitter or things like that. So I think that as women, we need to, one, follow our intuition and to figure out what our personal goals are. But they don't always have to start with the dollar figure in front of them because I can guarantee somewhere down the line it will have a dollar figure attached to it. And then we are very good at following and achieving what we want to achieve. We've just got to understand the steps. Beautiful. So I loved what you started with, which was that, you know, women's intuition is our superpower. And we're really good at being intuitive for everyone else, but not necessarily for ourselves. So that going within, love that. Very powerful. Thank you. So I've put a message in the chat that we will have time for questions. So if you start thinking about the questions, Sarah, I can see your hand up. I'm going to wait until we finish this next question and then we'll come back to you. And I can see you've got your hand up too, Sandy. Okay, so we'll come back to the both of you after we finish this last question, which is my favorite. Okay, which is, what is one thing women, the women here today and the women that are gonna be listening to this, what should we be doing? I hate the word should, but what could we be doing today to improve our financial situation? Over to you, Jane. Um, 
Yeah, I think, I think, and I think we've spoken a bit about um, resilience. What the way I kind of frame it is around, you know, there is something that's always working. We can often get very fixated that I don't know, I don't know how to do it, I don't have the right information, and and I don't know how to go about it. But in actual fact, as humans, right up until I think we, you know, fall off the perch, we always have something that's working. And often, when you know, if we look at the sort of strengths based model in that way, is is that say, so, okay, we're really great at the way that we turn up at work and the the work that we and we're really competent or we're really competent in, the, in our study or whatever it is. You know what? That just needs a little pivot that we can actually then lay that over into our financial situation so we often think oh it's so far away for me to be able to achieve I've got haven't got what it takes but in actual fact it's just a little smidge across in a way and if we can really recognize that part of us that they, you know what there is a whole lot working then that one builds our self-esteem two it makes us feel yeah I've got a little you know I'm capable of doing this and how can I apply what I'm doing over there to what I need to do to really be financially, you know, secure and really, you know, build some agency. So it, you know, I think the thing, the barrier can be that it's so far away, this attainment, but in actual fact, something is working very well. The fact that everybody got on this call on a Saturday morning out of bed, something's working here. So it's just to go, you know what? Yeah. And there's a lovely word called coherence. Something's always working in our lives. So that's my suggestion. Yeah, I love that. And as you were saying that, I was thinking the thing that I do well is I, I always um I always reconcile my zero every morning. That's a spiritual practice for me, you know, staying on top of that. So just extending that a little bit further to other areas of finances could be the first step that I could, the next step that I can take personally. So thank you. Love that. Okay, Tanga. Love it. Yeah, this is powerful. I'm going to watch the replay a few times. <laughs> Um, so I, I'll actually add to that rather than the first thing because it, it, we've we've talked about it before the need to really go in. Um, the next thing that I always would like to look at, and I do this myself, is how do I resource myself? What is it that I need right now? And that could be love. That could be something that you haven't really stopped to even think about. Resourceful also could be in terms of it doesn't money doesn't have to be the resource. It could be time, it could be space. Like think think about what is it that my body needs right now, so that I can ground. Do I need to walk in the grass somewhere? Do I need to get out to the ocean? You know, get into this expansiveness of what we are so privileged to be on something called Earth. You know, and it could be nourishment. What sort of nourishment do I need? Being in communities like this is an amazing start. And I would suggest you're doing the work already because you're turning up, as Jane said, you're turning up to the stuff. You're investing in knowledge. You're investing in growth. Continue that and keep that resourcefulness happening. And when you feel down, when you're in those dark days, what is it that you normally do? Is it meditation? Is it quiet time? Um, I've actually resigned from a job and given four weeks notice. And my daughter said to me, you need to go off and have a week off. And I said, that'd be great. I can take my laptop and I'll plan for the business. She said, no, 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 mum. No, I said off. So my mind and the definition of off was relaxing with the laptop in front of me, right? <laughs> Who can relate to that? So yes, resourcefulness. <laughs> Thank you. And I love um, your suggestion around grounding and nourishing, you know, because what I know is that when I ground and nourish, then I can access my intuition that Amanda talked about, you know, it's beautiful. Thank you. And that gives me the guidance of what I need to do next. So thank you. So Amanda? Um, firstly, how good is reconciling in zero, like the achievement <laughs> of getting that <laughs> and, and, and celebrating it. So that's one thing, you know, if that's your thing, Faith, one of the biggest things we can do as women is actually celebrate our achievements and reconciling zero and that feeling is, is awesome. So kudos to, to you. Um, 
Tanga, you mentioned too, what is it that you need? And one of those questions was, do you need time or space? And I think this is a really um, important part. So often, and as women, we do it because we're not putting ourselves first. I come back to that, not putting myself first is, I don't have time. I don't have time to look at this. I don't have time to think or educate myself about my finances. What we're actually saying is that's not a priority for me right now. And so what I think is the biggest thing as women we can do is make ourselves the priority. And a part of that priority is looking at our at our whole situation. But Tangi, you said, what is it that you need, whether it's love, space, and that is, it's taking ourselves as the priority. And then that will lead on to um, a bigger, brighter, beautiful, more abundant future for ourselves. So make yourself the priority and stop using the excuse, I do not have time change that mindset to I'm not making it a priority right now because if you believe that there is a balance in life I believe that you're wrong because there is no such thing as a balance as a woman there's a healthy imbalance there's always something in your life that is very important at that moment in time you know and for me there's those there's my little three pillars of family triathlon and work and depending on what time of the year I'm in will be dependent upon which one of those is more important important and so how do I balance three things I can't so there's always a perfect imbalance thank you for normalizing my reality about saying there is no such thing as balance because that's that perfect imbalance thank you. you just gave me permission just to be as imbalanced as I am <laughs> it's like taking a laptop on a holiday <laughs> I think that's bliss to me I couldn't think of anything more blissful but anyway yeah. <laughs> thank you so let's go to, we've got um, Sandy and Sarah. Sarah, you had your hand up first. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? So you're still on mute. Unmute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I just, um, I don't know if it's a question, but it's sort of, um, uh, it's tied up with the trauma that people were talking about and, and the shame. And for me, maths is so a big shame for me and I've managed to strategically avoid it and that <laughs> through life. And, and you know, um, so there's a big fear about finance for me because of that. And I, I don't know where to, sometimes I don't know where to unpack that, but um, it's, I, I really was good hearing some of the uh, speakers because, you know, late onset diagnose of ADHD it explains a lot about why I can't contain information very well. So, but on the other hand, I've managed to, I did take myself to a financial workshop once full of fear, but I just thought, well, I've just got to try and I learned some things there and I've managed to save some money, but I don't know where, how to keep going to maybe strengthen that. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Just would any of our speakers want to comment on that? I know there wasn't a direct yeah. question, oh. but yeah. Congratulations so on, on overcoming a fear of numbers to start with. So celebrate that you've gone and um, stood up and said, I want to, I want to learn something that has been scary to me. Um, and in this forum right here is a safe space. So you just need to find the right people or person to talk to and keep talking. And numbers is like anything, it takes practice. Um, so you you will get there, just find the right people to talk to, is my advice. Okay. Thank you. Jane, did you want to add something? You go for it. Yeah, look, thanks, Sarah, for bringing this up. This is a, a really common piece for a lot of people, which is around learning trauma. Yeah. You know, something when we started out in learning was very stressful for that little kid. And that piece is, is still kind of operating, still kind of taking the show. And I'm the same. I, you know, mathematics, I was terrible at school around maths and I still am. You know, anytime my husband wants to say, oh, work that out, I'm just here. I hear a carnival in my head, <laughs> you know, it's like, -da 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 like this. So it's very normal. That's just to kind of give you, to normalize it for you. And then 
that gives you a sense to go, okay, so I just need a little bit more time. I need to feel, as Amanda's saying, I feel need to feel a little bit more safe. I need to work with the right places. So it's just a management that you need to just, um, you know, you need a little bit more support in the in the, the emotional safety or whatever that is. And it's to do with the early learning piece. So yeah, great that you can see it because often we can't see it and we go, oh, I just want to avoid it. So yeah. Um, I, do, I do have one more thing on that and because um, Jane I, I have a really really good friend who is late diagnosed autistic and really cannot actually compute or retain numbers at all and she has it's this is not I'm not taking um, the accreditation the accreditation for this or the credit for this she gets um, her financial planner and her accountant and they tape their meetings so she can actually continually replay what mm -hmm. has been discussed in those meetings she takes it home and then her husband who is a numbers man they'll talk through it together so something I've learned in the past few years and I do say to some of my clients especially if it's on zoom would you like to take this similar to this um, recording today is about just asking do you mind if we take this so you can go back and um, replay it someone's just written in the notes as well they've put off a fear of their numbers or doing their tax again people should be open to having conversations with you if not they're not the right service provider because everyone should be wanting you to understand your numbers because they're not anyone else's but your numbers so always ask can you take these conversations so that you can replay it yeah great advice I do that with most oh. of them, like that because I get confused so that's great I'm going to move on to the next person and Tang, I'm going to get you to maybe prepare to answer because I know you haven't added there. So let's go to Sandy had your hands up next and I was I can see Pia and Kirsty. So my intention is to come to everyone, but we'll see if we can go as quickly, go through them as, um, as efficiently as possible. So Sandy, over to you. Yeah, well, before my question, Amanda is so right. If you are working with an accountant or a financial advisor that talks down to you or makes you feel even the smallest sliver of less than for a lack of comprehension, kick them out the door and find someone new that cheers for you. Because the whole purpose of having any of those people in our life is that they are cheering for us and celebrating us and elevating us on our own power and knowledge. Um, and I just, I also have to say before my question, Sarah, I could really relate to what you were saying. You know, my experience in every single decade is whenever I meet anyone who says they're not good at maths or they have a fear of maths, they are usually the people that I trust because they instinctively know more than they are aware in financial um, terms. And I find you, you are probably much more of a dynamo than you know of just instinctively knowing what is enough or what is right and getting the grasp of the big financial picture, even though sometimes maybe the nuts and bolts aren't there. So don't sell yourself short because you probably are a lot more kick ass because of just your instinct of big financial picture than you give yourself credit for. Um, nice. But the question, <laughs> the question I wanted to ask was, you know, Faith, when you were on the SBS Insight on that aging doco, um, there was another woman in the audience who talked about absolutely losing everything and then finding a way to survive with what she had. And I just wanted to sort of pitch to all of you in this financial arena. If we have someone here in the audience today that is feeling like they're at that point of, of desperation of knowing that they maybe don't have as much as we envisaged, um, what what's your message of hope and and resilience for starting from where we are now? Okay, so Tanya, I'm going to get you to answer that. Ooh. Thank you for that amazing question, Sandy. I'm going to put on my financial counselling hat uh, because I'm well. We are facing people that are looking to uh, wealth and wealth creation, but are very unstable in their current basic needs. And so it goes back to the fundamentals of financial literacy that I didn't learn in the bank. 
And this is our hierarchy of needs, is making sure that our roof over our head, food on the table, basic connections, think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and you can Google this. If we prioritize those basic needs, the interesting thing about this is this is actually how government also supports. So part of those basic needs is connection. What, how do we connect since COVID? Internet, right? So what we would normally understand to be our basic needs has probably been, you know, um, 10 x up. And so if um, Centrelink income, for instance, is protected income, no one, no debtor can take money out of that Centrelink. Centrelink covers your basic needs. Interesting thing about that, this is a side story, I had a client who was aware of that, noticed that the bank had taken $35 out for direct debits that were reversed for the last two years. She went to the bank and got it all refunded. So, so there are laws, consumer laws that are in there to protect us. But the very first thing, there's this James Bond number, 1-800-007-007. It's free right? You can get through to a financial counsellor in your local state. It would have been me 10 years ago when I was there. And we, we explained to you what your basic needs are. It's like they can advocate, they can talk to creditors, they can park things while you reestablish your basic needs and get stabilised again. So I think an answer to your question is really about how do we ensure that when we're getting later in life and our income has decreased, what are our rights when it comes to credit? Great. Mm. Thank you. I'm going to move to the next person just so we can cover more questions, but I'm going to add all of the speaker's details in the follow-up. Um, email with the replay so you can contact them directly, okay? So Pia, let's go to you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me here, Faith. And just thank you for this wonderful talk today. Uh, actually, really Sandy kind of psychically um, said my question in some ways, and I'll, I'll be real and say, I, I am one of those people. I've come from um, two abusive marriages, major head injury at 28, uh, which completely sort of put a stop to my career development. And I find myself now at 50, though not in debt, thankfully, well, except for hex debt, but, you know, aside from, <laughs> we'll ignore that for the moment, half that, uh, but aside from that, not in debt at least. But yeah, finding myself going, well, okay, I've managed to, uh, I've managed to show that I can uh, make a, a little go a long way, but looking at now going, well, other women in my age group, in my cohort in, in, in business um, are coming into their businesses with um, corporate backgrounds and with money and, and, and other supports. And I'm looking at that going, well, you know, what do I do? How do I, how, how do I make, that financial wealth uh, transition myself from kind of a basement level. Um, and that's, I guess, yeah, uh, and certainly working on, thankfully, as the things that you've talked about, working on uh, the trauma response and, and the story of self and others and shame and guilt and all that messy stuff that gets us uh, stuck. But so aside from that, I guess my, my question always comes up as what practical steps, what can one do? Yeah. Can I get one response to that? And we probably will go about five minutes over. If you need to jump out, because I just want to make sure we finish the question, please feel free just to slip out, okay? And you'll get the recording. So we would like to answer Piers' some question. One of our panel. I can't see everyone, sorry. I'm happy to jump in. Yeah, go, Jen. Um, yeah, look, I think it, it sound, what, just listening to you, it sounds a little bit about what we've talked to here around it, around that sense of agency, you know? It's like, okay, do I get a little bit wobbly around money or do I get a little bit wobbly about growth? Do I get a little bit wobbly? And I like to say wobbly because it just takes the shame out of it because, of course, money is a big shame bubble um, but if you say do I get where do I get shaky yeah is it that it's I'm getting shaky around taking that next step 
am I getting shaky? And that's where we get, there's so much we can learn from, from where we get shaky, yeah? All right, do I need more support? Do I need more financial literacy or do I need more financial capability? So, it, you know, we can't, yeah, I, it's hard for me to say exactly what your next step is and I don't want to be diminutive in giving you, you know what, you just need this. But wherever we are usually wobbly, is the place that we need to lean into. That's a kind of a good thing. You know, you know, I work for a couple of organizations and one of them in particular, we say, you know, don't let the fear stop you, let it show you the way, yeah? Because often that little wobbly place is ringing to us over here, over here. We often, you know, Tiger knows this, you know, in her field as well, is, is that fear is often laid down as that it doesn't feel right, but, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's not true, yeah? So in the past, that fear response was right, but it, now that we're here in this present moment, it may not be true, you know? When I wanted to get up and be loud in my family structure, I used to get shut down. So every time I wanna get up and be loud now, I get wobbly. But actually, no, that's not true. You're allowed to get up and be loud now, you know? So the fear, there was a really, oh, 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 very quickly, I used, I met a, a soccer room, uh, a woman soccer player. She said, you know what? Every time the ball used to come to me, I used to get freaked out. And then she learned rather than running and going, Whoa, she actually learned to lean in. Yeah. So actually that shaky can be the gift. That's my piece. Thank you. Love it. <laughs> okay. We've just got time for one more. So we're just going to do Kirsty because you were next on the list. Kirsty, I want you to ask your question and choose who you would like to respond to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, um, forgive me. Is it, is it pronounced? Tug, 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 tug. Excuse me. Tanga, thank you. Sorry Tanga, about that. I, I know. It's, it's, I've had Tajay. Don't. <laughs> Skip, thank you very much. So, my question is actually to you. I'm very, I, I have some friends who, for, for various reasons, are now deeply in the red. And it's not uncommon at, at this point in life. Big things can happen quickly. And um, where did, what was your starting point? How did you make your way out? And in particular, I guess, at, without it without living a life where you feel like so where you still had some joy in your life um the day-to-day -day pleasures that you actually need psychologically to stay strong on this path out how did you do that how did you structure it because my friends all often will say where, where do I start and I, I don't know I, I don't know what to say to that oh what a great question Kirsty because really at the time I had no idea I had to find out the hard way. But I guess this is why I do and we do what we do now is to try and um, bring this stuff that we've learned to people and, and to offer them opportunities. Fear is another thing. I've, I've started to learn fear is actually an invitation to grow to the next level because our system's doing what it's meant to do. It's doing the fight, flight or freeze. But what we know is, is that that fear also kicks in when we're going to level up. And so I always lean into that now. Um, so I think in when I'm reflecting back, there was a moment in time when a coach said to me, Tanga, the messier things are on the outside, the deeper you need to go on the inside. Does that make sense? So my reality was created by a lot of my trauma, the triggers, the, the soothing, the food soothing, the drinking, the alcohol soothing, all of those parts of me that I shamed myself on. But then when I actually did the work, realized actually I was in a trauma response for most of my life. And that's when fear becomes problematic. Does that make sense? So I think an answer to your question is the very first thing that they can do is to reach out. Most of us will have introduction um, options available that allow people to come in and just get a feel for what is there. And I'll tell you now, and I can promise you from the three of us, I don't even have to look at their work. I can hear it from their language and what they're sharing. There will be an element that you'll be able to take away or your friends can take away for free to get them started. 
So that resourcefulness also includes, okay, what's out there? That's what I started with was all the free. I just went in and I consumed what I could take and I learned. But there comes a point in time when you go, okay, I'm going around in circles, time to level up. The fear's coming in, but I know that, okay, no, it's time to go to the next step now. Wonderful. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Really helpful. Thank you. So we're gonna, I'm going to start to finish off, but Dahlia, I'm acknowledging that you're there with your hand up. So what we'll do is I want to honour the speaker's time. What we'll do is when we finish, if any of the speakers are okay to hang on, we can then get your question, okay? Appreciate that. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to just go around the room now for the speakers. If you can just share very briefly, maybe one minute, your special offer to, um, to, the, to the women here today and the women listening. Okay, let's start with you, Jane. Jane, you're still um, you're still on mute. Am I off mute? Yes. So I have an organisation called the Financial Wellbeing Company. I have put in the in the chat a link to our on-demand content. So that's a hundred hours of financial literacy and financial capability contact content. Um, yeah, and I'm giving a. Oh, so you're you're mute again. <laughs> so we got to I'm giving a, we got to I'm giving a that's the bit we got to. Giving to giving 150 uh so it's normally $150 per annum for the subscription, but I'm giving you 75% off if you put in the coupon silver siren. So that's an annual subscription to our hundred plus um content on financial well-being so there's the link in the thing plus faith will send out the link and i'll send you the coupon yeah wonderful so jane if you can send that to me again then i've got it there for, to go off on monday wonderful okay let's go to you tanga lovely thank you jane so i have a um an app i been designing and working with is called Your Money Bestie. And it's off the idea that uh, a lot of women said to me when I would say, uh, after listening to these stories, how do you take care of yourself? And they would often say, which I related to was, I would go behind closed doors. I would do the ugly cry so that my, my kids don't see it. I'd suck it up and then go back out. Mm -hmm. And that for me was the biggest thing because I thought I did that. I relate to that. So that Your Money Bestie is an app uh, that I'm going into a beta role. It's $8 a month. And the two workshops that are free in there within that is um, how to clean up. It's a manifest action five-day challenge. How do you clean up your finances? Get rid of the spending leaks. The second one is defining your North Star. And we talked about it before, the visioning phase. How do you define whether you're even on track? So Your Money Bestie. Mm, wonderful thank you okay amanda um i'm centered on one-on-one -on -one work so the the best dropper i can uh, give everyone is a, a three for two offer so i've put a, a link there that basically gives three mentoring sessions for the the price of two so it's a, a yeah it's a saving in that way but i'm always accessible to to bring and have a chat to if you just want to touch base yeah, beautiful i appreciate that so we're going to include all of the panelists detail in the follow-up email. I'm going to send that out to you on Monday. Okay, so if you've got any questions directly and all the special offers. So we, I really appreciate all of your wisdom. I've just gotten, I've got so many notes and I'm going to myself um, watch it again because I know that I would be a little bit distracted watching all this. So thank you so much for everything today. So we are just about to finish off. Okay, so um, Charlotte, can I just get you to turn off the recording?